Yeah, so I have a couple designated spots in the talk to ask questions. Uh, there's three or four points I've broken up. Uh, if you could give me questions at that point, that'd be great. Um, so like I said, I work at Talos, and I saw Talos like a huge sponsor here, and I still got accepted for some reason, I'm not sure. So I think they I might just got accepted because I work for Talos, but that's okay. Um, anyway, this is in the zone OSX heap exploitation. The title's a little deceiving. We're going to talk about a heap exploit that I wrote um, to attack iPhone and uh, Safari, but really what we're going to do is we're going to dive into the internals of the OSX heap um, and the different um, strategies that it has and how that whole thing works. Um, this is the obligatory uh, Talos slide. That's the team of Talos people. Um, again, I'm, I'm the one up here talking to you guys, uh, but every person here and every person on the Talos team has helped me in one way or the other uh, to have this talk. I couldn't be doing any of this without them. Uh, I don't know if this made its way over to Ireland, but a couple weeks ago there was a pretty big um, Apple patch that came out, and people had this big high, high line like, oh, stage fright for Apple, stage fright for Apple. Well, what do they mean? What is that? How, how, how is that going? So I, I had over 100, 100 blog posts about this bug, and people didn't quite understand what it meant. But here's the two, um, here's the two CVs from Apple um, that, affect, that, that this exploit is actually going to use. And... Um, I don't think I've ever given a proof of concept of this out, but since it's all patched and stuff, if you guys want a proof of concept later, uh, I'd be more than willing to give it to you so you can uh, check it out. So why did I do this? Um, we like, I like the fuzz. I like, I'm a vulnerability researcher, so I'm trying to find bugs. Um, I found a really juicy bug, a real nice bug. I, I, uh, I'm fuzzing. I already have RIP control the second I look at my crash. So I'm thinking, this is a win. I got RIP control. I can access it from Safari. I get the game over, right? What, what else is there to do? Um, so I go look up documentation on OSX. I find uh, a bunch of people have written a lot of stuff in like 2004 and like 2005, back when OSX was PowerPC. That's great, you know, that's awesome. But uh, that's not gonna help me much. So we have heat spraying that's not reliable or elegant. Um, so I first made this exploit, I just JIT sprayed. I did JIT spray, jumped to a JIT spray, I had 10% accuracy, I mean 10% um, reliability, boom, uh, that's a pretty good exploit. I don't know if anybody saw this, but at uh, Black Hat, Apple actually came out of the talk and they told us that they're actually they're redoing their JIT engine. Um, so now their JIT engine, uh, if anybody, does everybody understand what JIT engine is? A JIT engine for JavaScript is just just in time compilation. So when you put JavaScript in there, it has to compile that code and, and it makes the page readable, writable, executable. So if you jump to that, I can put shell code there, JIT code, um, and that's going to execute my code. What Apple's doing now is they're going to separate the JIT, they're going to separate data from the actual instructions themselves. So I, I can no longer just throw data in there. That's not going to be on an executable page anymore. Now that's on a writable page. So heap spraying is now gone on, on the latest uh, versions. Um, yeah, so we need an in-depth knowledge of the, of the heap algorithm because um, a couple things we're going to see, there's a couple safety checks in here that are going to try to prevent us from doing this heap overflow, but with a nice, with a good in-depth knowledge, we can um, bypass some of those. Um, this is just a slide just showing I'm not the first person to reverse engineer heap. There's been a million people reverse engineering heap before. Uh, my favorite is probably Chris Valasek or Dina Daisovi. Those guys are the, are the man. And uh, this, all this work is modeled after them. So uh, I have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, and like I said, this is all the, uh, if you Google OSX heap, and this is what you're going to find. And believe it or not, that Coco with Love Malak blog, uh, blog post, that's like a 100 word blog post. That's probably the best blog post out of all of them. It's super small, super easy, um, but it had a lot of great information in it. Highly recommend checking it out. Um, so all this research was done in 10.1.5. Um, we're on 10.1.6 now. Um, everything is still good. I also have a Sierra beta, which is coming out soon. I don't know how much you guys know about Apple, if you have any questions about anything, but Sierra is coming out in like a month. Um, and the OSX heap station is the same in Sierra as it is here. So all the work I did um, is still applicable. So here's where we're going to talk about um, the structures. Unfortunately, I have to give you a little background on um, what these heap structures look like. And it's boring. And I'm sorry, but if you could just bear with me, if you can even zone out, it's OK. Um, but if you could bear with me, I appreciate it. Then we're going to talk about some heap strategies and how I had heap overflow, right? Heap overflows are great, but they're tough to exploit. I think anybody that's exploited heap overflow knows that's not an easy bug. Well, what's an easier bug? A use after free, right? If I have a use after free, that's a pretty that's a pretty standard exploit. I, I mean, I pretty much understand how to do that. So how can I take my heap overflow into a use after free? And that's what that that uh, section's on. And then I have a few slides if I make it to, if I make it to them about ex actually exploiting Safari itself. Um, I'm hoping you guys have a little bit of knowledge of the heap. I'm going to go through a super rudimentary version here. These are just a bunch of allocators. But what I'd like to uh, do here is you divide them into two types. You have link-based, link list based allocators, and you have arena-based allocators. A link list based allocator, I'll skip that one, is uh, essentially it's just all the free blocks get thrown together, and they put this metadata there, self, previous size, next size, and so to get to the next block, all you're going to do is you're just going to walk down and find the next one that uh, fits. 
this is all well and good. And this is what leads to the Doug Lee Malik standard four byte, four byte write anywhere, um, old school heap unlinking attack. That's what this comes from. Um, what, this is great and everything, but the problem with this is if you want to deallocate, uh, memory, it's very, uh, intensive because you have to walk this entire length list. So, how do we fix that? We go with something called an arena allocator. And what arena allocators do is they, uh, allocate things based on size. So, the most famous, um, implementation of this is a low fragmentation heap, um, on Windows, which if you allocate 12 things of the same size, it starts to bucket them. So now everything, everything of size 10, it goes in bucket 10. Everything of size 11 goes in bucket 11. Um, and that makes it much easier for deallocation. You can now deallocate objects almost instantly. And that kind of looks like this. Um, so you can see, if we want to allocate something from slot four here, we would just go and say, hey, is there something in slot four? Oh, there is. Cool. Let me take that. Um, and that's just a, it's a, this is, this is a more modern heap implementation, and that's how most heap implementations are these days. Okay, we're gonna talk just uh, two seconds on OSX. So, anybody's programmed in C before has probably used libc. Anybody's programmed in OSX before has probably used core foundation. Core foundation is the basis of all Objective-C. It handles all of the, um, it handles all of the graphical, um, setups. It handles all the cross-process communication. handles all the kind of rendering things. Um, and so you're asking, you're probably wondering, why is this useful? Well, WebKit and Safari, WebKit can build on Windows, it can build on Linux, it can build on OS X, so it has to have its own internal heap implementations to work. So I have a heap overflow in OS X. I don't have heap overflow in WebKit. So we're going to have to figure out how to get around that. And this core foundation turns out to be the way to get around that. I'll go into that more as we uh, go along. Um, and just a real quick, I want to tell you about the, the things that uh, OSX gives you to help make your life a little easier. Um, because OSX is based on BSD, it has a, a similar um, BSD style allocator called GuardMalloc. Um, it's essentially the same thing as PageHeap or lib this locator if you use AFL. Uh, essentially it just marks pages as um, non-accessible and as soon as you free something it makes marks that as non-accessible as well. So that's going to catch all you set to freeze. It puts guard pages around uh, heap overflows. It's very, very, very helpful. OSX also gives you malloc stack logging out of the box. You can um, turn on stack logging and you get full backtraces on all your malloc, um, on all your malloc um, calls. There's another command called malloc history which is going to give you a little bit more output. It's a little more verbose. And um, you have to use it from the command line. You can't use it from LLDB. But I wrote a tool that can make you use it from LLDB. And it's infinitely better because malloc info crashes LLDB five times out of ten. So if you're working on something for an hour and use this stupid thing and now it's crashed and you're done and you just wasted so much time. So I usually use history um, and I would recommend that as well. If I'm t am I talking too fast? Everybody okay? You good? Okay. All right. So. I like to think of this as a, as a large umbrella, uh, like, a, like a big golf umbrella. So imagine you and your, and your five buddies, right, you're standing, it's pouring outside and only one of you guys got an umbrella. So what are you going to do? You're all going to try to huddle under there and huddle under the umbrella. That's what this malloc zone idea is. We have a giant overarching zone structure and then we have individual mallocs inside that zone structure. So um, something like WebKit is, uh, WebKit is version two. So WebKit malloc sits inside the same zone that OSX malloc does, but it's in its own version. So this, this overarching umbrella kind of manages all these different malloc implementations. This is going to make things like Safari possible. So I can have four, or five, six, seven different heap implementations all at once, and this zone uh, algorithm takes care of all that. So the magazine allocator, which is, the, mag the magazine allocator is a default OSX uh, malloc. Uh, not to be confused with the WebKit malloc, which is slightly different. We'll get to that more. As you can see, it's used by basically everything. Color sync, Safari, Kino, anything that's on, everything, anything that's on uh, OSX that's not WebKit uses it. And WebKit uses it a little bit, and that's pretty much that. All right, so the, I showed you the free list a little bit. It's just a, an arena-based allocator, so it's just a bucket list. It's pretty straightforward. And here's a, here is uh, the worst part of this exploit and uh, the best defense mechanism Apple's ever come up with. And it's the fact that they bind a magazine to a core. So what a magazine is, uh, I mean, so the region is where the actual um, memory comes from. So when I allocate something, it comes from a region. Well, a region is bound to the core of your computer. Um, and what happens is the as you go along and you block to the kernel, it can switch cores on you. So if, I, if I, I'm doing my heat massaging, I'm doing my heat spraying on core one, I then uh, do some file reading, and that gives a chance to the kernel to block. Well, now it comes back, and I'm on core two. 
So the, all the heap spraying I just did, all that work I just did is gone. It's not there anymore. I'm on core two. Core one's set up perfectly for me to exploit. Core two's not set up at all. This particular laptop has eight cores. That's eight different Malik implementations that I have to try to massage and try to get around. That's not going to happen. It's, it's, it's nearly impossible. I need, I need a way around that.
next and backward coalesce size. Remember our Doug Lee Malik invitation that we talked about at the beginning of this, where we had our unlink. We had a four byte overwrite unlink that you could do. That's very similar to what you can do here. Let's, I, 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 I implore you to think about what you could do if you could control forward coalesce size and backward coalesce size. I haven't told you anything else about it. Just keep that in the back of your mind. That's going to be a real key for this exploit is those forward coalesce and backward coalesce size. If I can control those two, I can win. I can, I, we can control the whole uh, program. Okay, so this is um, this is what our this is the little tool thing I wrote, but this is showing um, a tiny a tiny region. Notice this 256 slots, but only 64 are filled. And that's kind of a silly choice for uh, to do, but that's just what they decided to. And this is what a small region looks like. Notice it fills up all all 256. It takes care of everything. Okay, regions. So we have mag. So uh, let me recap this one more time. We have our overarching zone structure. We have our magazine malloc that's inside the overarching zone structure, and um, that's where our magazines are. And inside a magazine is a region. The region is where the actual code, where the actual uh, memory comes from. So when you when you allocate from something, it goes zone, magazine, magazine says, hey, I got a region, I got space, take something from my region, and that's where it all comes from. So that's where this region T is, is that where the actual memory co itself comes from. So I think I beat this to death already, but we have tiny regions and we have small regions. So you have tiny magazines and you have small magazines. So again, remember I talked about this earlier, but if you have an exploit and you're exploiting on, and you're setting up your exploit on tiny, and for whatever reason something happens, you have to go to small, everything you did is gone. You, you, like all the work you just did is no longer there. So you have to uh, ensure that you are massaging and, doing the, and hitting the right, um, the region, the right invitation. Yeah, so region metadata describes uh, chunk sizes, it describes how full it is. Um, we have a tiny metadata thing, and let's move forward to this one. So this is generally what the bitmap looks like. So to see if a block is in, uh, is in use, see how big a block is? So this block is going to be three quantum, because it's one and two zeros. That's three quantum, okay? Uh, and this second one means that it's an in-use block. This one is, one is two quantum in size, but because it's zero, that means it's a free block. So if we looked at our free list, we would then see this little guy is there, and he's free. And th that's our tiny regions. Our small regions are nearly identical, but they decided to put it all in one. So they put it all in one in one thing, and the top bit determines whether it's for free or in use. These are in use. These are free. Um, the top bit decides. I'm not sure why they decided to do one different for tiny versus one different for small. And here's some more information about the large region that you guys are more than welcome to check out on your own, or you can talk to me about it later. I'll be more than willing to just talk to you about it. All right, every region knows its, its magazine, knows what magazine it's supposed to be attached to, who, who, am, who owns me, what core am I on. I told you, you cannot switch cores unless you go to the depot. If you pin yourself to the depot, that means you, you now relinquish yourself, you're not being used anymore, and you uh, can be put on a different core. So if you have a region, it's always going to be on the same core. All right, and that's it for, that's it for the, the structures. I'm, I know I probably went over your head or you probably didn't understand all of it, and that's okay. It's not the most important thing in the world. But if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask at this moment. Can you we'll speak up just a little bit? Yeah, so, the, the, this, so everything on Apple is open source, but what you'll find about Apple open source is it's open source. And that means that, like, it's there, but it's not correct. So, like the gen the general idea is, is is documented, yes. But we had to reverse engineer the entire um, lib system malloc for weeks to get everything uh, perfect because the open source implementation is missing things. I'm assuming it's missing things because of proprietary um, proprietary knowledge and things like that. They just didn't put everything in there. But what I do give you guys, uh, if you are interested in re replicating my work, is I give you an entire marked up lib system malloc IDB on um, on my GitHub. The whole thing's marked up. The whole thing, every structure is defined. Everything is set up perfectly. Again, it's 10.11.5. 10.1.6 is the same. Sierra, the beta, is the same. But there's a chance that it's going to change. That's going to segue into this. I wrote a tool. Well, I, I'm not going to. I'm not allowed to say his name. He doesn't want to be. He doesn't want to be talked. Me and a good friend of mine wrote a tool, and we call it MacKeep. And it's an LDB Python script that allows you to access everything I just told you. You can look at any of, this, any of these pieces of information I just talked about. You can analyze all of them. You can um, do anything you want. What's great about this LED Python script is it's probably 700 lines, give or take. And if they make any changes to their structures, just change my structure. My structures are very easily set up. It's very easy to um, 
modify. We, we set this thing up so for the future, it's going to be very easy. I, I have plans to support this to iOS, so then we'll, we'll have the same introspection tools on iOS. We set it up very modular, very easy to adjust, um, so any, any uh, malloc changes shouldn't really affect our tool too much. But like I said, Apple does have a patent on this. They're not going to just change their malloc implementation completely because uh, they did spend a lot of time and research making this allocation scheme. So throughout the rest of the talk, I'm, any demo I give or whatever, I'll be showing you this MacKeep tool, um, and that's really the meat of my talk. That's where I put most of my time, and I would appreciate it. I mean, anything I say or anything I do on it and you guys don't understand or whatever, please just shout out. I will try to um, explain the best I can. Okay, so strategies. I, I talked about them. The, my main strategy for here um, is we need, we need to position things, right? That's, that's, that's problem one. I have these, all these checksums. I have a lot of checksum problems. I can't run into any of those problems. So I need to, I need to have a spot where I'm open with no free blocks. Uh, it's more difficult than you think. Um, I need to set up things to overwrite, and I do my, need to do my metadata unlinking attack. Remember, you're, you're supposed to be thinking in the back of your mind, if you control the coalesce size, what can we do? So that's, um, that's the part that was, I've given this talk before, and people didn't quite understand that. So that's why I'm trying to emphasize uh, that, just to kind of think about that, that the forward size, how big that, how big that block is, and how far back the, the next free block is, is controlled directly by metadata, and we can overflow that. So let's just keep that in mind as we go along. So I talked about this already, but the only the key t the point to take away home, home here, uh, most people are Windows people. Windows cache works um, if you any if you allocate a size smaller. So if I uh, if my cache is full of 200 bytes and I allocate 100 bytes, well it's going to take it off the cache. OS X heap is, does not do that. They it's exact only exact. So free list we talked about already, but it's linked list um, indexed by quantum size. So if you want to allocate a four quantum bo block, you go to you go to slot four. If there's nothing there, you go to slot five. If there's nothing there, you go to slot six. So on and so forth until you find a slot that's open. And when you find the slot that's open, you um, it'll cut that block open, coalesce the rest of the blocks together, and that's how that works. It's important because uh, if the cache is full and you're trying to set up, you're trying to set up your heap spray or you're trying to set up things like that, and it starts pulling off the cache, not the free list, not somewhere you expect, well then you're kind of in a, um, a bad predicament. So I, I like to clear the cache almost instant. That's the first one. The first thing we did in our exploit is clear off the cache. All right, so here we go. I think I'm gonna. I guess I'll try the pointer. I'm gonna do my best. This is tough to explain. Okay, so let's say we control blue block. I can overflow blue block as much as I want. Okay, and I have red block here, and red block's a three a three block free block. One means it's in use. Zero means it's free. Okay. So if I overwrite blue block, I overwrite them all the way to backward coalesce, right? To my backward coalesce size. Let's ignore the checksum problems, let's ignore all those problems at this point. And let's say we can overwrite its backward size. What happens if I point its backward size to another free block? I, so instead of pointing its, free, its, its backward size points to this busy block. So it knows when it tries to coalesce, hey, the block behind me is busy. I can't coalesce a busy block. That's a busy block. What am I supposed to do? I'm going to stay with my, by myself. But if I overwrote this backward size and said, hey, you know what, you actually are this big. Your backward size is actually back to here, to this free block. When the coalescing algorithm go, goes through, it's going to say, hey, the block behind me is free. Let's mark everything between me and that block as free. Those are all free blocks. So what that's going to do is it's going to take all these ones, all these ones, and you're going to get a, you can actually allocate two objects on top of each other. And by allocating two objects on top of each other by overwriting the backward size, we now have just turned a heap overflow into use after free. Two objects on top of each other I mean is it's the same same scenario as a use to free. So what what we do here is we're taking our heap overflow, overwriting some meta metadata to turn this into use to free, so we can get a standard a more standard uh, exploit out of it. Um, and so that's backwards. And the next slide is forwards. I'm not gonna. Next slide is forwards, and it's the same idea. You're just gonna overwrite these. Yeah, you're just gonna overwrite these, and you're gonna point. Um, this guy, you're going to point this guy forward into this next free block over here. The same idea happens. I've had much more luck with backward coalescing. I think backward coalescing is much more reliable. It works a lot better. Uh, forward coalescing is an ex extreme rare scenario. It's not super useful. Um, it's not super useful for, for the use after free type idea that I was looking for. So we didn't go in this too deep, but the same idea could be applied. Is there any questions on that? That's like the, that's the, probably like that's the most difficult thing to understand. That's like the most important part to understand on how we got this, how we took a heap overflow to a full exploit in Safari, that is, this is the magic. This is the voodoo. This is the part that people. This is the part that people are like, oh, how do exploit writers do it? How does how does it happen? That's it. That was the voodoo. That, so, if you don't, um, 
If you have any questions about it, please. It's, it's, it's not super difficult. It just took a really long time to figure out. Nothing? Okay. All right. So we talked about this already, but uh, it also have, we, there was also the four byte metadata overwrite. That you, you still have that same Dougley Malik overwrite. I could overwrite the forward or next pointer, the, the flink or blink, and get a four byte overwrite. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, there's a seven percent chance of getting the correct checksum. Well, that, that's pretty terrible. Um, but Dino Dizovi had a cool technique for uh, Snow Leopard, I believe is the operating system name. And you would just overwrite everything with null. Instead of overwriting them with pointers, you just overwrite everything with null. So then you can get to the you know, better meta metadata. So if I overwrite, if I overwrite all these guys right here, null, 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 backward m size better. When it goes to do a checksum, what's the checksum of null? If you check some null, it's just going to be null, right? Well, Apple thought about this already. And what they do is if everything is null, it goes in the region and marks it as a non-use block. It says you cannot use this block anymore. This block is no longer good. And so you have to do some coalescing to get that block back in use. It turns out that it's, it's um, unfortunately it's just not quite possible um, with the way that our heap overflow is set up. But that, that, was, that would be the idea is you overwrite everything with null. You then can coalesce again and get this block back in use um, and pass all the, check, all the, the checks and pointers. What we ended up doing, um, we ended up doing is, is that the checks and pointers, they come out to be uh, one, three, or seven. Like that was it. They were one, three, or seven. So that's thirty-three percent chance. I'll take that chance. That's that's where we left it at. I'll override the pointer. I just try with one, three, or seven, and that's where we that's where we left it. Um, obviously, if I wanted to do weapon grade exploit, if I wanted this to be better, if I wanted to be uh, the best of the best, you need to figure out a way to get around that. Um, and that's a serious problem um, that the OSX keep has for exploitation. Where are we? Okay, so. Does anybody in the audience feel brave or want to talk? Or just want me to talk? I like to talk, it's not a big deal. No? Okay, that's fine. Um, so let's say, for instance, we wanted to allocate uh, five quantum allocation. What are we going to do? We're going to go to five, right? And there's nothing there. So what are we going to do next? We're going to go to six. And we're going to go down six, we're going to walk to the end of it, and I'm going to give you this block. This is going to be the block you get returned. Um, and that's, that's basically how it is. If I want to allocate a block that was 15, uh, it would go to the end and it would say I don't have anything there. So what do you do if you don't have anything there? So we look in the cache. So you start looking at the cache. This is an exact match. Sure. Great. Allocate that. Uh, is it, is, is there a spot in the free list? Sure. Allocate it. Awesome. Uh, walk up the free list. Did we find anything? Okay. Great. Allocate it. If all those things fail, we allocate from the region. How do you allocate from a region? Well, it's pretty straightforward. You go to the mag bytes free at end and say, hey, I have this much many bytes available. Give me some bytes. Um, and that's more or less what it is. There's a couple of metadata, there's a couple of metadata of, um, pieces in, in the region itself that determine where um, you're going to get more bytes from. And we're going to, I'm going to demo this and show you guys how we can ac accurately predict um, all, any allocation well before it happens, um, where it's coming from, wh where it's going to be, how it's going to line up. We can predict all those things. Um, so I'm trying a new thing here. I'm not demoing till the end. I'm just going to do one long demo at the end to try to make this whole thing a little more cohesive. Um, again, if I uh, ask questions, as you uh, feel fit. Uh, I just had to put this in here just so you guys understand. Um, what this does, this is just a stupid Python script, but what this does is it forces every allocation onto magazine one. Um, you can, I mean, so maybe somebody can, but it's extremely difficult to debug uh, an application Using the OSX heap with LDB if you don't do this, because every breakpoint, my uh, every breakpoint, my core is going to switch. Every single breakpoint doesn't matter. Um, so every time I would do anything, it would switch. All this does is it goes through and uh, makes it sure that it goes in core one. It's always on core one. It never switches from core map, core one. All right. So that's everything from that's, uh, that's all our allocation stuff. Do we have any questions about how to allocate? We got. We're good with that. Okay. So the last thing. Before we go into a demo, and or before we go talk about that, do you guys want to demo? Well, I'm gonna demo this stuff, and then we'll talk about at the, the exploit. I'll demo how we how all stuff works, then I'll talk about the exploit. Okay, so this is a bitmap. I assume most people know what a bitmap is, but this is how it represents the entire um, malloc range itself. Okay, so we have a region, and we have a region bitmap, and uh, every one is a block in use, and every zero is a block that's not in use. So if you look at your free list, you can see where the free list objects line up. Why is this useful? When I'm having a heap overflow and I have an exploit, I need these objects to be next to each other. I, if this is my vulnerable buffer, I need to know what, what, what I have next. Um, so this, this region bitmap is very important to understand uh, so I can place my objects next to each other. So 
um, uh, Alex Sodorov came up with the idea of heap, fun heap feng shui in 2006. And the whole idea behind that is you flatten the heap. The whole idea is you're going you're gonna to flatten the entire heap, and then every allocation you make after you flattened it is going to be next to each other. That's just, the, that's, the, um, that's just the way it works. If I flatten it, there's nowhere else for it to go. As we said before, where's it going to come from? It's going to come from magbytes free at end. So if I flatten this entire thing, it's all in use, and I allocate two objects, they're going to be right next to each other because they're right back, they both came from the same part in the region. So how do we flatten the bitmap? Um, this is just saying that there's 56 quantum um, of free, free slots. And if you add all these numbers up, it equals 56 as well. But I said, don't do math in public. Um, so what we need to do, just make 56 single quantum allocations to flatten bitmap. Okay? We made 56 quantum allocations. It's still length 901. Let me go back a couple slides. Um, and it's length 901 here. Length 901. It's all still length 901. But now there is no, now there's no free slots anymore. So now the next allocation I make is coming from the back of this. And I make a 25 quantum allocation. 24 quantum allocation, and now you can see the length is 2925, and this whole thing's bigger. So if I made another allocation, it would go right there. Another one, right there. Another one, right there. So now I can put, if I can control objects, and I can control what I'm doing, I have overflows, I can actually get this to, um, I can actually position things perfectly with this. Uh, double free is not possible. They, uh, there's a, there's a basically a flag that checks for, uh, if, if it's been freed already or not, and, um, they check for that immediately. So, Heap spraying, this is my personal opinion, this is not anybody else's opinion, but heap spraying is kind of dead um, on OSX. It's uh, the 64-bit uh, address space is just too large, and there's a lot of these spaces that are dead because of these magazine structures and things, and we tried to heap spray, and it, it just simply was not reliable. Um, it simply wasn't reliable, and it wasn't um, going to work for us. All right, 521, I got about 20 minutes left. All right. So I'm going to talk about this product, MacKeep, great product, wonderful, it was fun. But what happened during MacKeep is I used this tool called LODB. Has anybody in here ever used LODB? Does anybody think it's good? I don't think anybody thinks it's good. It's a terrible piece of software. I mean, it's great, it's wonderful, it does everything it does, but it's extremely difficult to use, it's not user-friendly at all. So um, Doroko has a great LODB in it, it's awesome, it's cool, it, it does, it does um, some interesting stuff. But it doesn't do what I want it to do. I, I came from WinDebug. I like WinDebug. I want to be able to type POI, RAX, and get some, get some information back. I want to be able to do DW, POI, RAX, plus BC, plus this, plus that, and, and add all these commands together and do all this stuff. LDB, you can only do one command at a time. That's it. You can't, you can't have script callbacks. There's all these massive limitations to LDB um, that we, were ha were, we couldn't overcome. We're two guys who come from window, window, more of a Windows background trying to do this. We couldn't overcome it. So what I did, what we did is we wrote a, um, this is just showing you. The, the, this is just showing you how to make a breakpoint. Like if I want to make a breakpoint uh, that prints out RIX, like that's crazy. That just looks insane. If I want to make a breakpoint at main, I can't say break main. Like GDB says break main. That's how it would work. I have to do breakpoint set hyphen a tilde um, whatever that thing is apostrophe thing void main like C casting styles and like I don't want to type C casting when I'm doing LDB stuff. That's just that's crazy. Um, so it lacks functionality. It does. The, um, the Python functionality is, is terrible. It, it just, there was so many problems we had. So we just created a generic way of adding functions. We added alias and breakpoint managers. We have an entire full expression parser. We have an entire full expression parser. Then now we can do stuff like this. We can ask it local variable one with rax with main and tell me what's what is that address. And I could do dw on that. I can do whatever I want. We took we ported almost every WinDebug command we wanted and we ported it to LDB. Um, what happened before? What happened before is I didn't. Um, tell anybody about it, and so nobody's seen it. Um, after the last talk, I put it online, but nobody looked at it, so this time I'm going to talk to you about it a bit more. So I'm going to take a quick break, and we're going to do a demo. I'm going to demo you. Um, we're going to predict where allocations are going to come from. We're going to predict one off the cache. We're going to predict one off the free list. Then we're going to predict one off the region, and we can even watch the region grow up a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to show you some of the cool stuff we did with LEB in it. And like I said, I got 20 minutes left, and then from there I got 15 slides on exploitation, on how we exploit Safari um, with this bug. And that's that'll be it. I think I, I think I'll have just the right amount of time. <sighs> Okie dokie. Uh, if you can't see or I'm doing something wrong, uh, or just shout out, please. All right. Unable to find an executable. Where am I? Oh. 
Do you guys, are you guys interested in the code, or can you just believe me? I'll, I'll show you the code, I guess. <laughs> you guys aren't very trustworthy, huh? I know I got a black eye and stuff, but that doesn't mean you're not trustworthy. All right, I guess you guys want to see Vim too, huh? Everybody, you guys see damn Vim. All right, all this is going to do is uh, initialization. What initialization is simply doing is just calling free and malloc a bunch. I, you can't you can't do a heap of stuff without having some initialization code because think about when you, when Safari starts up, for instance, how much stuff does it do on the back end to set up the heap and set up things? Um, so that's all this is. This is I mean I know it looks kind of crazy, but it's nothing special. It's just calling malloc and free a few times to pull some information out of our region so that way we have a full um, list to deal with. And what we're going to do here is we're going to allocate uh, we're going to allocate ten blocks, and then we're going to free free a couple blocks. Oh, this isn't even the right code. It's not even the right code. I mean that in, that init stuff is still fine, but it's the predict one, not the pat one. Make that sweet. Cool. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, allocate ten blocks, and we're going to free ten blocks, and then we're going to hit a breakpoint. The reason we're hitting the breakpoint is I'm going to show you what the cache looks like at that point. And then notice we're, we're allocating a nine quantum allocation. Well, i is less than 10 means i is going to stop at nine. So the last quantum allocation it freed was nine quantum. That's going to be in the cache. That's going to come right off the cache. From there, we're going to allocate another nine quantum allocation off the free list. Uh, and then from there, I'm going to clear the free list. I'm going to wipe the whole thing and we'll allocate one off of the, uh, we'll allocate one off the region. So let me get out of this. It's actually the wrong one. I slept like one hour last night. So I'm sorry. I was a little, I'm a little, uh, I'm a little off, but that's okay. I hope you guys are enjoying the talk. Um, all right, so let's do run. Get this whole thing set up a little bit. Okay, so we're at a breakpoint, and notice it says symbol stub malloc there, um, and we're going to remove Xerox 90. Uh, Xerox 90 is a, a nine quantum allocation. That's just uh, 16 times nine is uh, Xerox 90. Uh, so let's take a look. So we do script exec file, so a loadable file, and my file is called load.py. It's just going to set up with the, set us up with a few basic structures. Um, so we run script. You're going to have Z. Remember Z is our overarching uh, golf umbrella that all your friends are standing under. Well, okay, so one of our friends is called the magazine malloc, and that's A. Inside the magazine malloc, he has um, a mag the magazine entries. And I set that up for us because, I, like I said, we're all in the first magazine. So that's T. T is our first magazine. And you can see T has a bitmap and T has a cache. You see this guy right here? Mag last free. 9 plus 144. Does everybody see that? Oh, I guess this clicker might be helpful. This right here. Maglas free is the cache. Okay? So let's take note of this address. 1001, 02D00. You guys believe me that's where the next allocation is going to come from? I hope so. So let's just do this. Uh, let's do H. Okay? So you can see we're going to call malloc right here of 90. I'm going to continue on. And notice it came from exactly where we said it was going to come from. Um, that's pretty good. Also, um, check out this. So um, forward disassembly is great, right? Everybody likes forward disassembly. But when you're a reverse engineer and you're trying to, or a vulnerability researcher and you're trying to exploit something, you want to know where you came from, not where you are. You know, you don't necessarily care where you are going. You care where you came from. Well, how the hell do you do backwards assembly in, in LDB? You could do something. Um, you could do something like this. You can do this s hyphen s minus on rip minus eight. And that's going to do something like that, but that's not even, that like, looks weird. That's like crazy. Why would I do that? So we wrote a little crazy, we wrote a little thing, and this is called backward disassemble. And so you can just disassemble backwards. And if I want to backward disassemble 10 lines, I can backward disassemble 10 lines. If I want to do 20, I can do whatever I want. Uh, it's much simpler, it's much easier, because um, when you do more RIP minus the value, that offset might be wrong. And uh, because opcodes aren't, uh, because opcodes aren't, aren't aligned, 8 might not be the right number. If I do, if I do RIP minus 9, the code I'm going to get is different. Like, that, like that's not that's not valid code anymore. Like what is what is this move ABS? That's not valid code. Um, but backward disassemble takes care of all that for you. And that's just one small thing that we have inside of our. Uh... Anyway, okay. What's next? We're calling another 90 byte allocation. Let's load it back up our script. So I really like my LDB in it, so I just like to talk about it. Okay. And so then we look at T again, and let's do print T dot dump. And all that is is just dumps the free list out. So we have uh, 23, 28, 30. We're allocating nine quantum. Anybody know which one it's going to come from? Nobody's going to come from 23. It's going to come from 3510. Um, so let's continue on. You'll see that here in a second. And as you see, the screen thing, malloc list free list, 3510. Okay. That's, you told me you could do that, Tyler. Why? That's not, that's not super um, impressive. That's fine. But let's clear the free list. Let's do something a little more difficult. Let's, let's do a little math. Let's have some challenge in here. 
Um, so now when I do when I do T, check out T's bitmap. Remember, I told you uh, it only holds 64. Well, when something goes to the 65th slot, it gets stuck and it's dead there. So that's what that last uh, free list allocation is. It's just a dead spot on the very end of the free list. But if I do print t dot dump, you're going to see there ain't nothing there. So what you can do is you can uh, take this address. I think I have a function that does this. Uh, it's okay. You can take this address. Um, and you, ma you mask off the you mask off the bits. You mask off the lower bits. I have a function that does all this. I just don't remember where it is. You mask off the lower bits, and then you're going to add um, the mag bytes free at end. And then you do number bytes magazine, number bytes in the magazine, minus the number bag, minus the number bytes free at end. And that's going to give us a number. You take the hexadecimal of that number. Again, I wrote a function for this. I just don't remember what it was. Uh, you wrote, you get the hexadecimal of that number, and that's wrong. Oh, because I did the. Why don't you guys tell me I'm being silly? I just put the same number twice. Come on, guys. I told you I haven't slept. All right, so we take this and we take this number, and now it's three ba zero. So what I did was I took the bytes free at the end versus the whole all the bytes. So I have let's say I have hundred bytes and there's eighty bytes free at the end. Well, that means I have I have to move forward twenty bytes, and that is where I'll be. So that's all I did. Just a simple basic math equation. You mask off the bits. That's where it comes from. 3BA0. There's nothing on the free list. There's nothing in, in the, uh, there's nothing that I, that we can predict it coming from. That's coming directly from the region. And, uh, yeah, that's coming directly from the region. And let's continue on real quick. And we notice region pointer 3BA0. See, so yeah, I fucked up the math and I still was able to get it right. Um, so that's impressive. All right. So that's, um, there's any questions about that? Do you guys want? I mean, so the, the we can we can I can show you the bitmap and I can show you how that works. I'll I'll tell you why I don't want to do that while I do it. How about that? So the problem with this is the problem with this is it loads 65,000 Python objects and 65,000 Python objects takes a long time to load. So when I wrote all this code, I wrote it on my iMac that has a super processor and it's super awesome. And then I moved to my laptop and I'm like, wait, I probably should load all 65,000 objects. There's like 40 objects in use and I'm loading 65,000. So that doesn't really make sense. I tried to fix this morning, but uh, I didn't sleep, so it was hard to fix. But this just takes just a minute to load up. But I'll just give you guys a peek at what, uh, what a bitmap would look like. Um, and uh, another cool little feature, well, I think the coolest feature the coolest feature, I think, is you can give me that address, and I'll tell you exactly in the bitmap where it is. So you do r dot at, and it tells you that's at block 954. So if I look at map, that's what my map looks like. I look at that map 954, and that's my that's my that's my five quantum allocation, or ten quantum allocation. Yeah, ten quantum. That's my ten quantum allocation right there. Um, and so from, by that point, if I have a free list item, I have objects. I can query exactly where they are in this, so I can see what I'm, what am I going to overflow next? What am I going to uh, hit next? So for my coalescing thing here, I need to position my block directly behind a free block. But and, and I can then by looking at the bitmap, I can see what other free blocks I can write it back into. So um, this bitmap becomes very useful. Um, we're going to do this one more time because I just want to show you what a bitmap looks like when it's full. I'm not full, but um, that, I mean that one was full. I want to show you what a bitmap looks like when it has a few items in the free list. So here's what the free list looks like, and then we do this. We do map. Oh. And bit bit dot string is just a stupid. Uh, I don't even know if you guys watch this type, but bit dot string is just a stupid thing I uh, wrote that takes a bit bitmap and makes it into a nice string format. Um, so, like, let's for instance, for instance, say I have I want to overflow this 23 quantum allocation. Like, what we want to see is we want to see where is that allocation. And then we want to do where the allocation is. We'll look at it. Hopefully, it only takes another second. All right, I got 12 minutes. I think we're good. Come on. All right, cool. So I lost at 8:49. Let's take a look at our map, and you'll notice that uh, so there's a 23, 23 block allocation there, and you'll notice that all these allocations are here. You can see them, all the zeros. It's very easy to see. Uh, but if I do map uh, 954, 849, sorry, 
849. Okay, if I do block 849, um, you'll notice there's that free block there. So let's hypothetically, hypothetically speaking, let me see what I'm going to over here. Hypothetically speaking, let's say I control something right here. I control that, right? I can then overflow into this. I can overflow this whole thing. And I can take this back, I can overflow this back right inside. It's going to hang out right here. Gotcha. Pull it off of him. Gotcha. Um, so this is going to, um, if I overflow this whole block to here, I overflow the whole thing, and I overwrite the backwards M size. Well, what happens if I put the backwards M size here? I point it back here. Well, when the, go when the coalescing algorithm happens, what's going to happen is it's going to think all these bytes are now free. So if I allocate another alloc allocation, it's going to get allocated right in here. And so what you can actually do, not only can you allocate uh, things on top of each other, what you can actually do is you can allocate things that are way too large for small regions. So I've actually been able to get 120, 130, 140 quantum allocations coming out of tiny regions, even though the maximum tiny region is 512. So I, you can actually trick the whole tiny region allocation scheme to think it has way more space than it actually does, and you can really uh, muck around with it with that little bit of coalescing. Any other questions? That's, that's, I think that's it for my demo. And then the rest of it is just going to be talking about uh, problems we had while exploiting Safari. Cool. Sorry, I'm just a little hard of hearing. Oh, how, how the checksum issues fixed? So the checksum issues fixed. Um, they're fixed hackily. So what we did was we did analysis. We uh, he asked how how can you get past the checksum problem? And I, I mentioned it just a, a touch. What I did was I ran millions and millions and millions of these iterations, and I took statistics on what the checksums were. And the, the, the checksums are not random. They are somewhat deterministic. Yeah, occasionally you get an outlier, but for the most part, if you, I've run this thing millions and millions of times, it's usually one, three, or seven. Those are the three numbers it usually is. That's 33 percent chance. I'm not an attacker. I'm, I'm a vulnerable researcher. My job is not to get 100% reliable exploit. My job is to prove something is ex exploitable and uh, get it passed, move forward, get us a little bit of publicity, show that we can do this, show our skills. But uh, it would take, it would probably take me another month or two to get a full 100%. I can pass the checksum every time. We'd have to come up with a new novel technique, and uh, it's, that's not necessarily worth it for, for my position and um, like my current, yeah, my current job. Like if I was a weapons grade exploit developer, I for sure would want to. Uh, be better at that checksum problem. Uh, I lost my mouse somewhere. Oh. Uh, keynote? There it is. Yeah. All right, eight minutes. Cool. Um, oh man, shit, one second, sorry. Fuck, I totally forgot. New All right, what I wanted to show you was this cool stuff. Okay, so let's take it H. So there's no other LLB in the world that does this. There's, so Doroko's LLB is cool, but it doesn't do any backwards assembly like that. It doesn't give you stack output with this amazing hex dump like that. There's no color code output. I don't like color. I'm more of a white kind of guy. We have a full color setup. All you have to do is say color on, and it would color. I prefer it to be white. Uh, all the rest of the dumping, that's pretty standard. This, this stack hex dump took forever. This uh, backwards assembly, as I showed you already, took forever. Let's just say we want to look at the stack. Um, let's look at words on the stack. So we can look at these nice words. Normally what you do is you do something like this. Um, and it looks like shit. It's like kind of weird looking. It doesn't quite fit. And you're saying, okay, what if I don't want words? I want double words. Great. Awesome. Well, what if I don't want, uh, what if I want to look at the pointer at RSP plus 16? So then you could do something like this. You could do POI. Um, I know this doesn't this doesn't look that impressive, but this is like ridiculously awesome compared to like what LDB does by itself. So I can do QD, I can dump words of the pointer at RSP plus 16, which is gonna it's actually looking forward, going to this pointer, keep referencing it, doing all that good stuff. That is stuff that's really hard to do in LDB. You, there's no way to script that. It's it's almost unscriptable um, without stuff like this. I talked about malloc history before. I don't think I have stack logging on, but you can just type history from the from the command like this, and it'll it'll run uh it'll run that malloc history command for you. Um, you can run proc maps. I don't if any of you guys are Linux people. There's maps that tell you the whole um, the whole memory layout, and OSX has something very similar to that. Um, 
So you can, but you can't query it from LDB. So I can't, you, there's no possible way to find page permissions in LDB. So when I to go to do my exploit, I'm trying to figure out what the page permissions are or something, LDB has no functionality to do that. So there's just small things like that that uh, really made it um, hard. All right, five minutes left, let me burn through this real quick, and we'll call it a day. All right, so the problem with Safari, it has five malloc zones. What the fuck? What are you doing, man? Like five malloc zones, are you kidding me? So I have a heap overflow, I have RAP control, I can hit this through, through Safari. I won, I'm like, I'm a champion, I'm the best person in the world, I, I got the best exploit ever. I get to this thing and, and it's crazy. Um, so what we have is we have default malloc. Well, guess what? WebKit doesn't use default malloc for really anything. They have WebKit malloc, they have WTF malloc. Why wouldn't they, why would they use my malloc when they can use their own? Um, this is typically what it looks like. You can see they use WebKit malloc and default malloc. So I just told you they don't use, WebKit doesn't use default malloc for anything. So why is uh, default malloc so large? Well, it's that core foundation stuff we talked about at the beginning. I don't know if anybody remembers that. But core foundation is the way that the WebKit is able to interact with uh, OSX and the operating system itself. So between that interaction, we're able to get things in our malloc zone. We're able to coalesce our mallocs uh, together. We're able to coalesce our heap all through this um, core foundation idea. So we have an image-based heap overflow. Core foundation works in this I.O. That's the default malloc zone, blah, blah, blah. So what do we need? We need information leak, and we need object to overwrite. The object to overwrite was really easy. There's, I mean, core foundation allocates so many objects, that was really uh, simple. The difficult part was information leak. But pretty much every allocation you control from JavaScript falls in WebKit malloc. But every call to new falls in default malloc. So what did we do? We went through and we, um, Found, we traced every single call to new uh, inside of every uh, I, every um, shared library that WebKit uses to try to find every call to new. We reversed every call. We, we searched the entire memory space for any pointers that might fall into some of these things to try to find any object we could possibly uh, use to coalesce our heap. So we found a couple heap massaging primitives. The audio context object, it doesn't offer arbitrary, it does not offer arbitrary uh, allocation, but you can do allocation size of three, four, or five quantum um, just by calling audio context um, with a couple different parameters. So that was pretty easy to start, that's, that's how we were able to, to massage our heap into a, a state that works pretty well. And uh, the other, another super hard problem here is that we had to write a server that you send, that you, can, that you write back to it and it makes new TIFF files. That's not easy to do. Like you, it's not easy to like, you, you go out, you get your information leak, and now you call back to your server, he makes new TIFF files to, to adjust this. Uh, it just was really, really hard to get that all set up properly. All right, and here is the, here's the, the hand wavy magic I told you about. We found one string. I don't even know if it's there anymore, because Apple saw this, and I don't think they probably, I don't think they left it there. But there's one string, and it's allocated uh, in the default zone. It's called date.prototype to two locale. You have like a three second window to hit this string. So this string is allocated on your default zone, and then immediately following that, it gets copied to WebKit malloc. You have to hit it before it goes to WebKit malloc. We have core issues, we have core integration issues, we have a lot of issues here that have to be overcome to make this perfect. You have like a split second to overwrite that null byte on that thing, on that uh, date to prototype locale, locale string, so that way when it gets copied over, it copies too much data and you get your information leak out. Um, again, I'm not a weapons grade, I, I'm not a weapons grade exploit writer, and um, it's not the most reliable uh, technique in the world, but it works, uh, and I, I, it's pretty impressive. It was a pretty uh, good find, and it was pretty hard to do. So just uh, as a general recap, we have our three quantum allocation. We empty a quantum. We do our backwards coalesce I've talked so much about. We get the chunk freed. You remove that null terminator, and then when you in JavaScript, you read back that date. It gives you back more information. You now have an information leak that you can use. I told you before, RIP control, no problem. There's a lot of objects to overwrite. And uh, that's how we got code execution. And that's how uh, we, were, we were able to attack Safari. I would show it to you now, but like I said, it's like 20, it's like one in 20. So uh, like 5% reliable, I guess is the, the word in that. And nobody wants to see me throw 20 exploits at Safari, so. Um, we'll continue on. Anyway, that's it for me. But if you guys could all, um, if you guys are any interested at all, all everything, this whole slide deck, all my tools on, on Mac Heap, I just released that LDB in it uh, today on GitHub as well. So all that's up there. I am one blank wall one, and that's my talk. You guys got any questions or anything?
This is about three months worth of work. Yeah, give or take. Um, I just want to show you guys one more thing. I know, I know. So it's like three more things. Come on. All right. So let me let's say this. I want to I want to reverse engineer malloc, right? Okay. So how do I find where malloc is? Okay. Well, let me tell you. You do image list. You just do image list, and it'll tell you where malloc is, right? So your image list. Okay. Well, that's that's cool. Okay. Well, which fucking one of these is malloc? I don't know. So let me just do command f for malloc. All right. I can just command f in my terminal. That's going to find malloc for me, isn't it? Oh, cool. It found malloc for me. That's wonderful. But if you have more and you have more mallocs and you have more stuff, it can't find malloc for you anymore. So we created a little thing called this module. So now I can just do lm malloc malloc. It gives it to me right away. Perfect. Okay. Let's say that's awesome. I know where the module is now. I want to know every function that has the word malloc in it. How am I going to find out every function that has the word malloc in it? I don't know what fun what malloc I need. I have no idea. Well, now you can do something like this: ls malloc, and it's going to come back. These are all the places and all the offsets where malloc is used and anywhere in this program. Um, again, things that LDB simply can't do. One last thing. I'll get off the stage, I promise. Uh, so this is this is main, right? What if I wanted to know what every call in main? Because I know a lot of you reverse engineers uh, are call reverse engineers. That's how, that's how you're taught. You reverse call to call to call to try to understand the flow of programs. Okay. What if I want to see all the calls? Okay. Well, I can do this. I can again. I command F call, right? I can. I can kind of go through, but you saw it went super far up. Now I'm, I don't even know where I am anymore. Like this is terrible. Okay. Well, so my next option is I can copy all this. I can copy all this data and put it in Sublime Text or something. Look for call that way. Or we can do something called dsearch, and you do hyphen n main, and you just do call. And there you go. You guys, all the calls for malloc, all the calls are free. Any call that that program makes, it shows you where it is, how it's done. You can do that for anything. You can do that instead of call. You want to jump on equals. It shows you all the jump on equals. Instead of jump on equal, you want to do ads. It shows you all the ads. Like, so you can do that for any, any, um, you can search through any program for that, and that works extremely well, and LDB is not able to do any of that. Um, that's my LDB init pitch. I hope you check it out. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. Um, I'll be around for a while if anybody has any questions, questions or any of that good stuff, or if you want to talk about it more, or if you want to see me throw exploit 20 times, feel, feel free to come up. We'll do that too. Thank you so much.